sweet, good to go. And so okay, good. let's go. Yeah. All right. So I suppose we'll just looking at you or looking yeah, there. Sorry, if you can. Yeah, look, look at Frank. Frank okay. Mm -hmm. right, we'll just um, get straight into it. Um, firstly, what sparked your love of AFL? Was it something you had from like from childhood, or did it develop over time? Mm -hmm. My great love of AFL football started when I was about six years old and I had a, my brother who was 15 months older than me and we'd do kick to kick in the backyard and I guess you could say it started when I was about six and I've had a great love of AFL football ever since and I've always wanted to play the game ever since I was a small kid. Mm. Uh, what are some of your earliest memories of playing football? Well, mainly I used to go to the Western or now Witten Oval at Footscray with my brother and I was in the cheer squad and we would do kick to kick after the game and then of course we wanted to form our own football team because I always wanted to play footy. I did aspire to play at the highest level but I didn't think I was ever that good. But, um, but there was, and then we, we formed our cheer squad teams and we played on a Sunday because you didn't play football on a Sunday then or VFL, AFL didn't play on Sunday, so we would then compete against one another. Um, stop. Yeah, it's all right, she can come in, all good. It's all right, Elder. Come in, come in Elder. So Thank you. Questions. Thanks very much. Thank you. Yeah. So we just do the, just do that one again. Yeah. It's, um, yeah. What are some of your earliest memories of playing football? Well, my earliest memories of playing football were when I used to kick the football in the backyard with my brother because um, all his mates would be mucking around playing football and I wanted to join him, Did not having a sister. So I just decided I, and I love football from the moment I picked up a football, was always kicking it in the backyard or kicking it wherever I could or with dad and mum didn't play football, of course. So um, it goes back to many, many, many years. Yeah. Uh, you're a huge supporter of the Western Bulldogs and even nowadays the ex, um, ex-president. Uh, how and when did you fall in love with the Bulldogs? I fell in love with the Bulldogs again when I was about six years old. Um, it was, uh, my father was a policeman and he was stationed at Footscray and he wanted me to barrack for the Shinbone in North Melbourne. And being the little rebel that I am, I just decided the blue and white colours I didn't like. I like red, white and blue. So my brother and I, at the age of six and seven, we made a pact that we were barracked for Footscray, as it was known then. And I have barracked for the Footscray Western Bulldogs ever since. And my role with the Bulldogs in the, the senior role that I undertook started in 2004. Well, actually, it goes back even further. It goes back to 1996 when the dogs were on their knees and we were lacking membership and very small membership. We were practically insolvent and we needed to uh, formulate a business plan going forward. That was in 1996 and we formed that and I was the only woman at the time and um, then David Smallwood came in and became president and did an outstanding job for 16 years and then he handed it on to Peter Gordon but at that time I was already on the board. I joined in 2004 and the first job they gave me when I joined the board was the redevelopment of the Witten Oval a $32 million redevelopment, which was a very difficult job, particularly in the west of Melbourne, and that was my task. Welcome to the Western Bulldogs. So I worked on that project with the CEO at the time. We worked very closely together for eight years. We've got our redevelopment and more. Uh, we've got fantastic membership now. We'll probably be free of debt by the end of this year. When I joined the board, we had 11 million in debt. So being vice president, uh, it was quite an achievement. I was very um, humbled to be the Vice President. At the time when I was asked, I was fighting for my life in intensive care um, and it came down to two, Peter and I, Peter Gordon and myself, and in the best interest of the club, it was best that Peter took it on and he's doing a great job and I'm now still heavily involved with the dogs and will be for the rest of my life. And uh, what do you remember about uh, women's opportunities to play football during your teen and young adult years? There was just no avenue for women to play football when I was growing up. At 15, my father decided enough was enough. I was playing against boys of 15, and boys of 15 are really young men, and they were tackling hard, and I was tackling pretty hard, and I was getting injured. And Dad said, enough is enough, you've got to hang up your boots. So at 15, I had to hang up my boots, and it's something that stayed with me forever. It's something that should never have happened. And I always wanted to see young women 
be, uh, be given the opportunity to play the game that they loved if that's what they chose to play. So my love affair and in promoting women with, with football, I guess you could say started back when I was six. Then when I hung up my boots at 15, I had this burning desire within me to say, this is not right, this, should, this shouldn't happen. Women should be given the same opportunity as men. And of course, that's been something I've been driving, I guess you could say, that agenda forever. I didn't have the resources or the know-how or the, didn't have the contacts at that time. But I'd been watching from afar a long time, seeing football develop with women. And I don't think a lot of people realise that football, women's football started in 1915 when the men went to war and the women stepped up and joined the, the men's team. So really it started in 1915 and even before then, but officially in Fremantle, Western Australia it started. So it's just, I always say the first hundred years is the hardest. So it's now up and running and uh, it's just amazing. Mm. Yeah, and uh, do you believe you would have played in a national women's, women's AFL competition if it had been around in your playing days? Absolutely, I would have wanted to play. I'd need to be good enough. I know I would have worked hard. Uh, I thought I was a pretty good footballer. My father said I was. Uh, he always used to say I was better than my brother, but Dad was an umpire and a policeman, so he knew everything. And Richard, um, my brother, he, he used to love playing footy. He played with the boys at uh, school where he went and afterwards he played, but I would have definitely, absolutely played and I would have been there on the doorstop, you know, the knocking on the door as soon as uh, training had started because I love the game. My father used to say I'd eat a football. I love it so much and I watch all games of football, not just my own team. And um, in our interview with uh, Rob Hess, he noted that AFL has a huge female supporter base. Why do you believe this is the case? Well, we, women make up 53% of the attendees at AFL football now. And did you know we've got nearly 400,000 young women playing the game? Who would have thought that when I started playing f over 50 years ago? You know, we've got um, a thousand new community clubs. They cannot cope with the demand from young women now. There's 53,000 have registered for odds kick this year, both. So it's just growing and growing and growing and it's just, um, we've now got big problems with infrastructure. So it's not just the flavour of the month, this has been evolving for years. And when the VWFL started in 82, we've had these young women out there playing the game who are now too old to be given the opportunity uh, to, to be able to play the game in the, um, the AFLW. So we've got all these young girls coming through now and it's just evolving the whole thing. So I know that if I was 15 again, I'd be knocking on the door. I think I wouldn't be too bad either. I, I, think, I thought I was a pretty good tackler. Mm. And um, why, why do you believe the um, VWFL was the first women's AFL competition to survive over a substantial period of time? Well, they were mainly um, run by volunteers, but they had got to a stage where they were growing so large that they didn't have the support, certainly the sponsorship support that they needed. And I'd been watching them from afar for quite some time, uh, visiting grounds and sort of standing out there in the outer, just watching the talent. It's really funny, the first game I went to, there was the biggest punch up I've ever seen. And we used to have the yellow card and the red card. And of course, half the team was sent off because they'd been fighting. So we had a team depleted by half. So that was my first match that I went to. So the girls know how to play footy. So I could see that they were really on their knees, struggling financially, and they really needed to get somebody in there full time. And uh, I was a guest speaker at one of their functions and um, just prior to speaking I'd spoken to a number of the committee and I got, got a, an understanding of these women and what they were trying to achieve and they were not going very far because they didn't have support, certainly no corporate support. And I decided to write them out a cheque and that's the thing that really got them going, got them somebody full time. And I continued to do that over the next four years and then of course I sponsored the Bulldogs team to get them on the field for the first game and and also I salute Melbourne Football Club because they too supported their women to get to go on the field too and play that first exhibition game I think about four or five years ago and that's really what gave the women the platform and then of course the televised one last year where more than a million people saw, liked it and now really really follow the game so I guess that was the catalyst too. Mm. Uh, you did mention briefly about um, writing the cheque and in an interview with Rob Hess he noted that you donated uh, 25000 to the VWFL to help it stay afloat. 
Uh, what inspired uh, this incredibly generous decision? Well, at the end of the day, I love to encourage these young women to be their best, whether it be sport, business, whatever they take on. But at this that particular time, they needed some help. And I was just so honoured, so privileged to be able to give them that platform and to see them now progress to what they are today. It, it, the satisfaction, it's hard to, it's perhaps hard for people to imagine, but for me, I know I've played a, a small part in helping these young women and I see now how many young little girls now are aspiring to be like their heroes and to see the little girls with their numbers on their backs of their jumpers of the girls that they want to be like, that's all I need. That's huge satisfaction for me. Mm. Uh, you, you did mention earlier you joined the Western Bulldogs board in 2004. Mm -hmm. uh, do you believe that women such as yourself joining numerous club boards has contributed to the push for women's football? Well, firstly I'd like to say that when I joined the board of the Bulldogs it wasn't because I was a woman, it was because they, I had certain skills that they needed. And as I say, I was given the most difficult task to find all that money, $32 million in the west of Melbourne. So I joined that board because I had certain skills. And then when I joined, three other women joined, all with certain skills and very talented women, smart, intelligent women. And we had nine on the board. We had a nine-member board with four women. We're the only club in the AFL that had four women. And then, of course, other clubs have followed, and they've got one and two on their boards. I think we bring to the board table something very different. Um, um, we have a different perspective on things. And the men have been actually quite remarkable. Been, I can speak on behalf of my own club. I don't know what goes on in the boardroom of other clubs. But it's been, we've been very uh, much accepted by the rest of the board. Um, our work has been just as tough as what they've had to do. And it made no difference that we were women or men on that board. Uh, looks like we're going to have to stop this. Yeah. Mm. Sorry, sorry. Yep. sorry. What's interesting is... Um, it made no difference at my club, I could speak on behalf of my own club, that we were women, it didn't make any difference if we were men or women. It was about a skill set, we had it, and I think the leadership has been very important at our club, it's filtered right down, and about half, half of our staff are women at senior positions. So it's not something new at the Western Bulldogs, we've been doing it for years. And we've always been a great believer at the Bulldogs, we pick the, the best person for the job, whether it be male or female. So. If that's a flow on to the rest of the uh, AFL, that's terrific. And I think it is flowing on. And women have different sets, uh, different skill sets, I think, to some of the men. But we complement each other. We're not in competition. We complement each other. And uh, at what point did you truly believe that a national AFL women's competition was going to be reality, not just a dream? Well, when I spoke to Gillan McLaughlin those few years ago and I went to see him and asked him to come to a breakfast that I was putting on for women in football, the response was fantastic. He is a champion of change. He is a man that really, really got behind us. He's the man that supported this whole concept and he brought it forward as we've seen. He brought it forward from 2020 to 2017. I didn't think I'd ever see that happen, but Gil knew it was a good business model. He knew at the end of the day, AFL would win out, the women would win. They'd be given their opportunities sooner rather than later. So uh, I knew that when I met with Gil, this is my personal observation, that we were on the right track, that I knew Gil could see the writing on the wall, he could see that this was a good business plan, it was going to be a win-win for everyone. So I suppose three or four years ago when I spoke to Gil and McLaughlin, and I know others, I'm not the only one, there's been plenty of wonderful people knocking on the door too of the AFL. I just did something a little different to the others, but it was going to happen, but it happened a little earlier. There was just no way of stopping it, it was just a revolution going on. Mm. And uh, you were appointed as the inaugural ambassador of the 2017 mm. AFLW season. Mm. What does that honour mean to you? It was an incredible honour when they gave me that honour um, and going up to the Gold Coast and presenting that cup to the winning team. And what's really interesting, a lot of people don't know that uh, I was asked by a journalist what was the defining moment for me up there in the Gold Coast when I presented that cup. What did it mean to me? And I said, all these young ladies, these ladies from Adelaide who won the, the Premiership, and rightly so, they were so good, they all come running over to me to thank me for giving them the opportunity. Now that touched me, very much so. And the person that touched me more than anything was Sarah Perkins. 
where every club had slammed the door in her face. They didn't want her. She wasn't needed. Adelaide gave her a lifeline. She's now got a premiership medal around her neck. Not only is she a gun forward and one of the best in the league, she lost an incredible amount of weight to, to go and play the game that she loved. She still continues to lose weight. She still continues to train and be very fit. So it meant a lot to me, not just about the cup and being their ambassador, which I was very proud to be asked to do it and, and, and going up there and seeing all these young women. And what's interesting too, 16,000 people turned up to watch the game and when the men's game followed straight after that, only 12,000 were there for the men's game. So that was interesting too. Mm. And uh, what, what um, was your favourite moment from the first season of AFLW? Well, the very first game I was invited to the official function. i have been waiting this, for this moment for 55 years. And we had the official function, as my father would say, Sue, you don't go for the, the food, you go for the, for the football, because I love football. So a lot of the people went off to the Carlton side, and I decided to go to Collingwood, to, because obviously of my relationship with Mo and lots of the young women in Collingwood. And I wanted to sit on my own, and people kept coming and sitting next to me, you know, wanted to talk to me. But I wanted to sit and experience that moment, because I'd waited so, so long. In fact, I almost get teary even thinking about it. And I kept moving and I moved and guess where I finished up with the Collingwood cheer squad. They left me alone and they were very gracious in defeat. And when that ball went up the first time, the tears just appeared and I thought, it's happened. Women now will get this opportunity that they, right, they rightly deserve. And to see 26,000 people there and to repeat it again the next night with a lockout of the Witten Oval and all the families turning up that meant so much to me. I, I, it's very hard to put into words just how I felt. I think the tears explained it all that first night. Mm. Uh, if you were to play alongside the AFLW side, uh, mm. what position would you play and why? Absolutely in the centre. Yeah. I always like to play in centre. I like to be in the action under and down there getting dirty. I used to love playing in the centre. I knew I could make a difference in the centre because I was tough. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, how do you feel about the future of the AFLW competition? Do you think it's in good shape going forward? The AFLW is in, in very good form. It's just growing and growing and growing. We can't seem to stop it. Um, as I say, we've got 400,000 young women now playing the game. I know when I became... The AFLW is in very good shape. It's going from strength to strength. We have nearly 400,000 young women playing, um, playing the game, 1,000 new community clubs. We can't keep up. It's just absolutely amazing. But what's lovely about it, it's the men are complimenting the women and vice versa. I know that I've been to my own club and I've seen the men, uh, male players, talking with the female players and complimenting each other, talking strategy. It's just wonderful. I mean, it's not a competition, men versus women, or vice versa. It's about working together, and I can see it happening at my own club, and I'm sure it's happening at other clubs as well. So it is a revolution. There's no stopping. I can see it's just going to get bigger and bigger all the time. And it, 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 as you can see, the stats now that have come out from the AFL. Mm. Yeah. Uh, what do you think? Is it all right for you to ask one or two more, if that's fine? Right? Sure, go yeah. for it. So, well, yeah, you can look at me for the question, but then just if you keep looking at Franklin here. Okay. So. So obviously, like you talked about, you think the can't control the growth. Do you reckon that is the hardest part of going forward, providing the, the grassroots opportunities, the pathways up to let the, these girls, the, uh, the rush or influx of girls, yeah. have a path to go to? What we've done is we've created a, a career path for young women now if they want to either play football or be an admin or even be a CEO. So we've got that career path for them. I don't see a problem with the growth. My biggest concern right now, and I'm working on it, is infrastructure. We have so many teams. In fact, they've even had to shorten some of the games to fit four teams on one field. We've got a problem with infrastructure, and we have got to resolve that. And that's why it's very important we don't bring on any uh, two more teams at this point in time because we need to consolidate what we've got, get it right, get the infrastructure right, and then things will 
occur the way they should occur with proper facilities, not what we've got right now, which is absolutely substandard. We can't have this for our women. But also at the end of the day, the men will benefit too with the upgrading of these facilities and improving the infrastructure all round. So it'll be, again, as I say, it'll be a win-win for all. So what do you think the blueprint and the, that needs to be done or implemented to get these new structures and... Well, I know I'm working with a number of councils right now with on infrastructure and we're trying to put a paper together to take to government. We're also inviting other councils to become involved and we'll be meeting very soon with a view to doing all of that because the local councils can see they cannot keep up, they cannot cope with the expansion. But we need to, if we go to government and to the AFL and to others, we need to have a proper business plan and that's what we're working on right now to make sure and to ensure in going forward we have all these facilities for these young women and men to be able to play the game. Um, yeah, no, that concludes their interview. Yeah, I just as, as a group we'd all just like to really thank you for taking it's a the pleasure. Time day to, I've yeah. always got time for students. I'm yeah. um, chair of BU Foundation and that's the University of Opportunity and the reason why I'm there is because those kids don't, a lot of them don't get an opportunity yeah. to either do tertiary or TAFE and I provide scholarships for those kids um, and I, I, anything to do with students I'm always happy to help. I always drop whatever I'm doing um, to do to help kids uh, particularly students because I know you've got aspirations and you're what are you what are you wanting to do when you finish? Well it's probably different for everyone but sports journalists. Yeah. yeah. Go for it. Yeah. yeah. I made some nice friends over the years with sports journalists. You've got to be a little cautious yeah, yeah. when you're <laughs> when you're on the board. I mean yeah. you've got to you've got to be very careful, nothing leaks. Yeah. Which I can say at my club nothing ever did leak. Yeah, yeah. And now I can have a much better um, say, I suppose, but um, I'm still guarded, you know, you've got to be very careful. Yeah, yeah. So you've got to work that out, you know, how are you going to get, yeah, get it out of them? Exactly. Yeah. Michael Warner from the Herald Sun's not bad at that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But anyhow, thanks guys for coming. No